can open your Bibles if you don't already have them open to John chapter 1. And the master theme of the Bible, the Lamb of God. I don't know how many times I have uh, preached a version of this message. But it began many years ago. I picked up a book by Sidlow Baxter, in which was titled The Master Theme of the Bible. It was all about the Lamb of God. And one of the chapters outlined the ten scriptures from Genesis to Revelation that unfold this master theme of the Bible. And I want to use my opportunities this month in a month when people are, get all excited about holidays and rituals and routines and, and um, great presentations. I want us to look at the Lamb of God. I want us to look at Calvary. I want us to look at the price that Jesus paid. And, of course, his glorious resurrection as well. So let's pray. Father, we pray for the ministry of the Spirit of God upon the Word of God and upon our minds and hearts. And we bless you and praise you for this opportunity. In Jesus' precious name, amen. When John saw, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What a calling. Uh, that, that should never get old to us. The entire master theme of the whole Bible is the Lamb of God. And so we're going to see that from Genesis to Revelation. And I want us to see it in the context of, as we turn to Scripture, to behold the Lamb of God, the more we behold the Lamb of God, the more the Lamb of God will have our affections. And the more the Lamb of God has our affections, the stronger will be our ability to have wisdom and to fight off the world, the flesh, and the devil. They'll all lose attraction. When Jesus has our hearts and we have this growing thrill of the Lamb of God, uh, we're going to function more as his disciples and as soldiers of the cross. So we'll go back to Genesis chapter 4, and you have these references because I hope that on your own time you will set aside some time to look at these passages and to trace this master theme through the whole Bible. We will read some of them. We will call attention to some of them. So in Genesis chapter 4, verse 3 through 7, we have Abel and his lamb. Uh, they came to worship. And Cain and Abel both came to worship. They came to the right God. And it says that Abel, verse 4, brought the firstlings of his flock and the Lord had respect to Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had no respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance failed. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why are you wroth? And why is our countenance fallen? Here is, uh, if you want to call it counseling, here is one of the greatest counseling lessons that you'll ever come across and it's right at the beginning of the Bible when you do the right thing you won't be angry and you won't be, you won't be depressed and if you've done the wrong thing and you're willing to repent you can be restored 
And if you insist on staying in that wrong way, you'll probably wind up doing something else bad. When you trace history, the history of man is long with rejecting God's revelation. Adam and Eve did it. Here's how you're to worship. Here's what you can do, what you can't do. We have a better idea. And so they pursued their idea. It's been trouble ever since. Rejecting God's instruction, replacing them with our own way. You want to know why our world is filled with angry people? At the root of it, we have a lifestyle of rejecting God's way and getting mad when God doesn't approve. Uh, There are many things that pastors know that they can't teach or can't preach. It doesn't matter that the Bible presents it, but you can't teach it or preach it because the congregation will get angry and are there leave. Uh, If you don't understand that, if you don't know that, that's because you've never been a pastor. I've I've talked to many, and I've had my own failures, but I've talked to many pastors over the years, and, well, I I can't do that. I can't say that. The the best giver in the church will leave, or there will be a meeting, and I'll be asked to leave. This is an old problem. So they came to worship. And in this, we're looking at the necessity of the Lamb. It's not enough to worship. There is the necessity of the Lamb. And Hebrews 11.5 reminds us that Abel offered his Lamb by faith. Faith in the revealed will of God. True worship comes by revelation, by, not by human reasoning, but by finding out what God says and adjusting ourselves to it, not according to what we like. And so worship uh, has to be, there has to be the shedding of blood. God had already shown Adam and Eve that. And so while we do not have chapter and verse for all the teaching that Cain and Abel received, we know that they received it. And we know specifically that Abel was doing what he was doing because he was having faith in the revealed word of God. He was not going to lean to his own understanding. And so his offering tells us that he was conscious of his sin and conscious of his need of forgiveness. Have you ever come to that place where you were conscious of your sin and your need of forgiveness? And once you got to that place, you found that I didn't just sin once. Uh, I have this tendency, even as a born-again Christian, I have this tendency to sin. And the only way to deal with it is to come and to trust in and rejoice in the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Uh, I read somewhere many years ago that a famous evangelist was talking to a psychologist in London, England, and that man said in all of his practice, if the people he was dealing with could just be forgiven, could just experience forgiveness, all of their other problems would go away. You'd be surprised how much problem there is because we've not come to the right fountain so far as forgiveness. Have you been made conscious of your sin and the need of forgiveness? And do you come in the name of the Lord Jesus to his throne of grace? Cain's offering had nothing in it that would indicate that he needed any any forgiveness. Uh, He's there to show what wonderful things he can do. He's worshiping the right God. But his worship was not by faith. Cain did not believe God. There are a lot of people who believe in God, 
but they don't believe God. Cain believed God, or believed in God, but he did not believe God. God's word is not worthy to be honored and followed. He was not an atheist. He just wanted to come to God in his own way. And he was astounded that God was not impressed. Look at my fruit. There was no uh, awareness or confession of sinfulness. Churches today are filled with people in the pulpit and the pew, hoping to get to heaven by their good works and their religious practices. And they have no thrill or joy about the the blood of the Lamb. Both Cain and Abel's offerings showed the indispensable necessity of the Lamb. Am I there this morning? Death is not far off. Eternity lasts forever. What offering do you bring? When you stand before the Lord, if he were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you say? Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. That says it well. Is that where I am? Or am I hoping that I can be good enough? What, in whom is my hope? Then we go to Genesis 22, and there's a very famous account there of Abraham coming to worship. We've seen the necessity of worship, or necessity of the Lamb. The incredible story with Abraham and Isaac is we see God's provision of the Lamb. Uh, Abraham... He's, he, come, he comes to worship, but he has, he has no lamb. He thinks his son is going to be the one who is to be sacrificed. But he trusted God to provide. Uh, and that's where we need to have our focus. Uh, he had faith to believe that even if he had to, we know this from the New Testament, and we know it even from the Old Testament where he told the, the guys, there, says, look, Uh, Isaac and I are going to worship, and we are coming again. What an amazing thing. Well, we need to come to God and worship, but we need to bring a suitable offering. What is that suitable offering? We're the ones who deserve to, to, to die. So, with Abraham... God provided a lamb. And when Jesus came to Calvary, there was no one to take his place. He laid down his life. This was in the economy of God, Revelation 13, 8, from before the foundation of the world. God held back Abraham's hand. But God did not stop. When Jesus willingly laid down his life and the Father willingly poured out his wrath on his Son. So here's an incredible Old Testament portrayal and prophecy, the the unfolding story of the master theme of the Bible, of God's provision of a lamb. Then we move forward to Exodus 12. And there is the Passover lamb. And again, we know this uh, this account as well, where God was making a way for Israel to escape Egypt. Were the Israelites any better? Were they any less sinners than the Egyptians? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And it was not good enough even to have a lamb. They could have chosen a perfect lamb and met all the qualifications, but the lamb had to be slain. There was no value until the lamb was slain. What did the Bible say? When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Then in the unfolding account of the master theme of the Bible, there's so much in the book of Leviticus that emphasizes the necessity 
of the character of the lamb being perfect and without blemish. Some 20 times in this book, which can be hard to read, uh, the lamb must be perfect in order to be an acceptable, satisfying sacrifice. What a comfort should be in our hearts today that Jesus died as our sinless sin bearer. Now, as we're tracing through the Bible and we're looking at the master theme of the Bible, uh, all the lambs that are portraying that which God is going to do, that which he's already committed to do, we're looking at four-footed animals being chosen and, and slain. But when you get to Isaiah 53, in that wonderful passage of the Old Testament, you find that the lamb is a person. In verse 4, Surely he, Jesus, hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him with his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord, God the Father, hath laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. The master theme of the Bible. Up to this point, the verses were speaking about animals that were slain. They were substitutes. They were pointing to something beyond themselves. But here... It's a person. And we'll see and be reminded a little bit later in the New Testament, there's this guy, he's left the city of religion. He's still empty, but he's reading the right book. He's reading uh, the Bible. He's reading from Isaiah 53. And he doesn't understand. And Philip will, from that same place, preach to him Jesus. So after Isaiah 53, we come to the text passage of John 1, 29. The prophesied Lamb of God is Jesus himself. He is the one that all the others pointed to. If you're here today and you're a lost person, you've sinned, you deserve hell, the word of the Lord is, Behold the Lamb of God, look and live. There's no other way. So, if you're a Christian and you need to be empowered for daily living, behold the Lamb of God. 2 Corinthians 3.18 But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed, metamorphosed, unto the same image from glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord. Beholding Him, we're transformed. This is why there's no study that could possibly be more profitable to the Christian than to go to the Scriptures and look for the Lamb of God. He's on every page. From Genesis all the way to the end, that's the master story. There are a lot of subplots. There are a lot of things that are good and important, but it's all rooted in the master theme. How often... Do I sit and behold and look for Jesus? What was one of the first things that Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, told his apostles? He took them through the Old Testament. He said, look, the Psalms, the Pentateuch, the first five books, the prophets, they all speak of me. Well, when you look at all those texts, what's being said? It's hard to find very many pages, but you come to grips with lambs being slain. All pointing to the Lamb of God. All unfolding the master theme of the Bible. If that's the master theme of the Bible, shouldn't it be a master theme in our lives? Should it not be clear testimony that this is the way of salvation? Should it not be clear testimony that 
to win spiritual battles, I need to behold the Lamb of God. Beholding him as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, we are changed, metamorphosed into his likeness. The same sort of thing is given to us in Hebrews 12, the first four verses. And just reading a part of that, he's, he's, he's said to the first people who got this book, uh, there's a great cloud of witnesses, all the people up until that point in time who had lived by faith. And then he said, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Oh, so what was that all about? He came as the Lamb of God. He has many titles. But his master passion, his master uh, purpose in life was to be the Lamb of God. And so he says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. We don't have an option about spiritual battle. We're in a war zone. How, how, how well are we using our chief weapon? Behold the Lamb of God. To empower you and I in spiritual battle. Behold the Lamb of God. The more we behold Jesus, the Lamb of God, the more our affections will be transformed from loving the world to being thrilled with Jesus. The more sin will lose its attraction. For as, behold, as, we, as we behold the Lamb of God, we have to see again and again the incredible price he paid. And he endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. What an incredible reality. What was that joy? He knew that when that price was paid, that in John 17, the scripture talks about all that the Father has given him. Those are the ones that he saves. Well, what if someone came to you and gave you a great gift, but it cost you? Cost you your life. In John 17, in the high priestly prayer, Jesus is talking about all that the Father has given me. What a price he had to pay to receive that gift. What an incredible wonder, child of God. You are a gift from God the Father to Jesus. And Jesus did not flinch in taking that gift. He went steadfast to the cross. Oh, the master theme of the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. Now we move on to Acts chapter 8. And that's where we see Philip. He's going along. He's been moved by the Spirit of God to have a divine encounter with the Ethiopian eunuch who's been to the city of religion. And he's got the right book in his hand. Do you understand what you're reading? No, how can I understand unless someone help me? And he joined himself in the chariot with this high-profile person in that part of the world. Even though, in, in some sense, he would be a slave. He, he had an honored position. But he was empty. And he was leaving empty-handed. And at that same place where he was reading. And the place where he was reading was, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, like a lamb dumb before his sharer, 
so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation and judgment, in, in his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. So who, who was he speaking about? Himself? Someone else? Verse 35, and then Philip opened his mouth, and at that same scripture preached unto him Jesus. In Isaiah 53, Jesus is being unveiled as the Lamb of God. So he preached unto him Jesus. You can't preach Jesus without a grand primary focus on Jesus as the Lamb of God. So he went his way. They found water. Here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The point here is that the Lamb of God is not only identified as Jesus, but he is identified as the Christ, the promised Messiah, the Son of God. Now we go forward to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 through 29. And this passage goes through all the information that we've gone through thus far. Uh, for as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain lifestyle, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest for you in these last times. And so uh, this passage uh, tells us that those who are redeemed is not by corruptible things. There is the necessity of the lamb, as we saw in Genesis 3. He was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Here is the provision of the lamb, as in Genesis 22. As vital as the sinless life of Jesus is, we're not redeemed by his perfect life, but by his precious shed blood, as we see in Exodus 12. The lamb's blood must be spilt and applied. Again, this passage in Peter says he's without blemish and without spot. That is emphasized over and over in Leviticus. The prophecy of Jesus, uh, the prophecy of the lamb being a person. We've covered that in Isaiah 53, John 1, Acts 18. In just a few verses... Uh, the Spirit of God moved Peter's pen to summarize the entire Old Testament and even into all of the New Testament. Why would he do that? Because the master theme of the Bible is the Lamb of God, and it should be our master theme. But now, Peter does in verse chapter. 1 verse 20 and 21, he goes beyond what we had already learned thus far. The Lamb is alive. The resurrection of the Lamb is set forth in these verses. And so we're looking not only in faith at what God has done, but we're looking in hope at what the Lamb is doing and shall be doing in days ahead. Because he is the risen lamb. And so, wonder of wonders. You know, one of the saddest things is that people go to the book of Revelation and they don't look for Jesus. It's the unveiling of Jesus. But I'm not here to look for Jesus. I'm here to look for what's going to happen. I've got this map here and I've got this chart here. And I'm going to prove to you it's this way and this way and this way and this way. That's not what it's about. It's about the Lamb. It's about the unveiling of Jesus as he is today. And so 20 plus times in the last book of the Bible, who's it talk about? The Lamb. 
And so we see in chapter 5 of the Revelation, in that great momentous time, and John is already seeing so much, and he sees this scroll. To understand all the intricate details of this is not necessary for, for you to understand that which is most important. That which is most important is that John understood that if these scrolls could not be opened, there's no hope. Not only for now, but for all eternity, there's no hope. So he weeps uncontrollably because nobody's found who can undo the scroll, the seven seal scroll. And then he is told, the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. And I've said many times here, and I need to say it again to my own soul as well. We have situations in life and we sometimes think like that. If I could just be a lion, I'd get some things done. And then John looks. He's been told the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. And when he looks, what does he see? He sees the lamb. The lamb as it had been slain. The master theme of all the history of this world. The master theme that is glorified in heaven. The master theme that you will be focused on in heaven for all eternity. Jesus will be seen as the lamb. So why is the lamb of God not my focus? The lamb is in heaven, enthroned, victorious, working through those on earth who are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Moving events. There are a lot of events happening on the earth. I don't know where they're coming from or where they're going. And I have a feeling sometimes that those who think they're in charge don't know where they're coming and where they're going. Well, fallen man makes a mess of stuff, doesn't he? And it's probably going to get worse. But in the midst of it, just like the disciples in Acts 4, they're being thrown in the prison. Man, it's getting hard to be a Christian around here. We might as well uh, find a hole somewhere and hide. I don't know if they literally did this, but as they were praying to the Lord, they began to pray from the Psalms. Lord, behold the heathen. They're raging. But the bottom line of that prayer, give us boldness to preach the gospel. And if there was ever a time in our lifetime where that needs to be our focus, it's that now. You won't get anything but upset and frightened and wringing your hands as you look. And I don't care if you look at the conservative reports, the liberal report. I don't care who you look at. They don't have a clue. And they're not going to say, oh, but by the way, here's what you need to be focused on. They're not going to say that. They had some sort of press, I would assume, in the days of the early church. Oh, we need to go down to the headquarters of the government and see what's going to happen. No, they just had a prayer meeting. And they opened the book and said, Lord, look at it. Why would they do that? Because they know that man's not in charge. God is. And they also knew that they were not to sit on their hind ends and do nothing. We have an assignment. Lord, give us boldness with the gospel. Pray for those who are in harm's way in many countries. Pray for ourselves, Lord. My trials really right now are little, but it's important to win those little trials because they're preparation for winning the bigger ones. They're what God has on our plate today. And if I am not responding right to those, how can I expect to have any 
experience and readiness to respond to big ones. Don't worry about what may be on the plate tomorrow. I often think of Corey Ten Boom's experience as a child. And she's getting on the train. Her father is there with her. And she's concerned. Dad, I, I'm concerned that if I were to be called upon to be a martyr, I wouldn't have the faith to do it. And her father wisely said, child, when do I give you the ticket for the trip on the train? He said, you give it when I'm about to get on that train. And God will give you, child of God, grace for today. He's not going to give you grace for tomorrow. He's going to give you grace for today. And whatever tomorrow has, there will be grace for that. And we need to camp here. Because this is the only way, and it's the right way, to be prepared for whatever is coming. And those disciples in Acts 4 knew that by the grace of God. Here's what's happening, Lord. You know. Here's what the heathen have done. What they're doing. But Lord, give us grace to be faithful to you. So, the Lamb is in heaven. He's enthroned. He's working through his redeemed. He's moving events and nations. And what does this mean for the future? You go all the way to the last chapter's of the Bible in Revelation 21 and 22. And you see the Lamb is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We come to the climax, the glory, the time when uh, He has come to rule and reign with all power for all eternity. And the prayer, the model prayer that we are encouraged to pray becomes reality. Thine is the kingdom. Thine is the power and the glory forever and ever. And there's going to come a day when his kingdom is done on earth in the same manner as it's done in heaven. So these lamb passages unfold for us the doctrine of salvation. And when you're saved, what is it that you receive? I'm sure that clock is not right because it says 20 after 11. I don't think I've got that much time left. It's it's about 10 to 12. So the the last, the back side of your uh, outline, we look at the same passages from a different angle. And it's important, but we're not going to spend time there today. You do some of that on your own and let the Lord thrill your heart afresh and anew. Uh, This is a study that's just not for a moment. This is a lifetime. If the Lamb of God is the master theme of the Bible, should not the study of that theme be our focus until we get home? And when we get home, What will be our worship about? It'll be worshiping the Lamb. So, how glorious is this wonderful theme? And may we so enter into it that in this coming week, we are at peace. We're not troubled by the storms of the world. It's this kind of thinking that is behind the Paul statement Whether I live or whether I die, I am the Lord's. When you read Paul, he's very keen on the crucified, risen Christ. Uh, He might not have used some of the terminology exactly like in the passages that we've read. But he is well taught in the scripture. And he knows that the master theme is what God has done and is doing through the Lamb. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Behold the Lamb of God. I wonder what I would like for us to sing. To what? 
Two thirty three. Is that what you got picked on? If I want it, okay. Well, let's do that. By the way, as we close, we, 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 we can't afford to miss this. One of the first references in, uh, to the Lamb in the Revelation is that when God begins to intervene, all those who are lost cry out for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them because the wrath of the Lamb has come. You will either meet Jesus, the Lamb, as your Savior, and you worship him and you serve him, or you will resist and you will despise him and you will hate him, and you will face him as your judge. Behold the Lamb of God. Flee to him, come to him, rejoice in him. The worthy response, and this will be the last reference. You wonder why the book of Revelation is such a book of worship and such a book of songs that are said and sung. It's because of the victory of the Lamb and the worthiness of of the Lamb. And so he says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. I don't remember all the details, but one time in what used to be Morningside Assisted Living, I was leading them through Songs we sing then have a little devotion. And I wasn't thinking about it, but I had chosen a number of hymns out of the hymn book that we use, and all of them were about the cross. And so when I got up to speak, I said, Why are there so many hymns about the cross? And a sweet lady who in earlier years had sat in these pews said, Because Jesus paid our sin debt on the cross. And how, how, what, how was he functioning? What, what, he was being the lamb. The lamb of God. Hallelujah. What a savior. Our oh, Father, we bless you and praise you for these scriptures that we can pull together and see the most astounding message of the entire Bible is holy as you are. Your holiness confronts us with an impossible situation. We're not. And we have nothing to pay our sin debt. But then we see the Lamb of God. And we see it's not an afterthought. And may, as we go forward, worshiping, serving, being thrilled by the Lamb of God, be our chief motivation and be the strength of our souls to stand fast until you call us home. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.